Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service of the First Presbyterian Church, Eufaula, Alabama. Please stand and join me as we call ourselves to worship. Who may abide in the presence of God? Who may live on God's holy mountain? All those who walk blamelessly and do what is right. All those who speak truth from their hearts.
seated. Good morning. And welcome to First Presbyterian Church this morning. Our Minute for Mission person is not here today. Uh, so at this time, I'll go ahead and invite you, if you'll please fill out and pass those friendship pads that you'll find in your pew. Uh, I will, while I speak for just a minute on mission, as we're going to be experiencing the word here in just a bit, every Sunday, the word should be calling us to mission. Every Sunday, the Word should be calling us to some form of action. Now, what does that mean? From one week to the next, it could change for each one of us in some way, shape, or form. But we have to be open to it. We have to be willing to respond to what the Word is calling us to do. And, it's not, and it may not be the same thing for each one of us, even though we hear the same words, we experience them differently because it's the Spirit working on us to inspire us to respond to the word. So it's going to come through in different ways. Maybe it's going to mean you're feeling more compelled to head down to Harabakoa when we go down for the next mission trip. Maybe it means uh, fill in the blank, or we can talk about it, or we can figure out what that is, what it means, or what it looks like. But the main thing is to be open to it, to allow ourselves to be changed by it and influenced by it. And that's the hard part, because change is scary, right? Oh, come on, admit it. Change is scary, right? <laughs> okay, so I, I would just encourage you to be open to that frightening experience that is change, because sometimes that's where God is leading us, is to some kind of change within ourselves, around ourselves. Now, uh, as far as announcements... Uh, there's a couple in here. September 9th, right? <laughs> if there's any debate, it is September 9th. Choir rehearsal resumes. And as we've said, there are plenty of choir robes, multiple sizes. We've got one to fit anybody. And if not, we'll figure it out, okay? Um, so please do come out. That'll start back following WOW on September 9th. And our talking theology on Thursday topic, it, we're still working through a few of the mystics. Now, mystics, we're not talking about, you know, magicians or anything fancy like that. It's actually about spirituality and some spiritual journeys of early Christians. So there's a few in particular that some of us have chosen that we'll kind of be talking about and presenting. If you'd like to come, we meet in my office on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. The, this will be the first week of the new time for Midday Prayer Group. So Midday Prayer Group will meet at 11.30 a.m. on Tuesdays, uh, and immediately following, I'll be heading out off to Kiwanis. Now, one thing I do also want to call to your attention is that at our Thursday night meeting session, decided we decided as a group to start meeting on the fourth Thursday instead of the fourth Tuesday. So that should show up on your calendars and just so you see that change and make note of it. Very good. Well, that's enough announcements. Let us continue to prepare ourselves to worship God. So now with sincere hearts and minds, let us confess our sins before God and the world, trusting in God's mercy to forgive. Please join me in the prayer of confession. God of light, we confess that we live in the shadows of hypocrisy and self-righteousness. We honor you with our lips, but we have not served you with our hearts. We are satisfied with human traditions and norms and avoid your liberating truth. We confess meekness, meekness, holiness with social conformity and anger with righteousness. Forgive us, we pray. Now the power of your word, save us from the prison of our conceit so that we may serve you sincere hearts through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My friends, do not despair. God renews us by the word of truth that we might become the first fruits of God's new creation. 
So in the name of Jesus Christ, know that we are forgiven and be at peace. Please join me in prayer. Lord, by the power of your Spirit, open our hearts and minds to receive your word that we not forget the wonders you have done, nor neglect to make them known to our children, nor fail to tell them around the world. Amen. Our first reading comes from James chapter 1, verses 17 through 27, page 229 in your Bible. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is a little more diced up. This is from Mark chapter 7. We'll just say selected verses. On page starts on page 42. One of the... We do love the long readings, don't we? But we don't want a lot of them. And so basically what this is doing is it's pulling out the particulars of this passage. The... the in a nutshell, what Jesus is trying to get across to the disciples as well as the Pharisees. So listen now for the word of the Lord. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, 
Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And Jesus said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandments of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out or what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, when we look at this text today, there are several things to take away from it. Looking first at James, it's about being doers, as we were just talking about a few minutes ago living into mission, expressing where we feel called to do mission work, mission work, that work that God calls us to. Be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. We're going to get more about deceiving ourselves in a few minutes. But by contrast, James is looking here at when he's talking about looking in the mirror and turning away and then immediately forgetting what you're like. It's a very shallow existence. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, they do not forget. But the doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. So that's one of the ways sometimes when we're looking at mission in a church is we see where it's being fulfilled. We see where it has more life. Because we can do something for years just because that's the way we've been doing it, right? I know. I grew up in a small southern church. I know. <laughs> we do it because that's the way it's been done. For instance, I think it was an Episcopal church in Atlanta. Um, they had, if you could imagine, in their sanctuary... There was a beam that went all the way across the sanctuary, and it was lower than this light fixture, okay? Now, as, as my Episcopal priest friends say, they do love a parade, so they have routinely, they will come in with, uh, you have the acolytes to light the candles, you have various carrying in of the Bible, and then you would have someone carrying in the, the cross. Well, so what would have to happen in order for this young man or woman to get the cross past this beam is they had to stop, okay, they had to stop, lower themselves, and take a step forward and then come forward in order to place the cross in its proper place. Well, of course, that's what you got to do. Otherwise, you're going to hit the beam. So the church saved up some money, and they were due for a renovation. Renovation comes through, and, they, and the architect said, well, we got to get rid of this beam. So they, they got rid of the beam, and they, they redid everything. All right? But what didn't change? <laughs> 
the one time that the, the, the young man goes up to go all the way through, immediately the church says what? No, that's not how you do it. <laughs> You ha and so what they had after that was even with the beam gone, the, uh, the person would have to step forward, kneel down, bow, and scoop through with the cross as if the beam were still intact. <laughs> because that's the way it's been done. Because that was more important and that was such a part of the introduction of the service. No one else had to do it. The acolytes, the, all the others would just go through and, and bring items in as normal. So we get caught up in sometimes what we see rather than why we see it. As, as uh, I'll try to remember to send out the, on, and wow this week we watched, at least I liked it, uh, a pretty good little TED talk on basically the how and the what and the why and at the center of it all is why is we want to challenge ourselves and look at the why well in this the why was there was a beam in the way but all anyone saw was how reverent it was for this individual to bow as they're carrying the cross but that wasn't what the person was doing the person carrying was realizing this is a physics thing. Two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time, right? That's basic physics. <laughs> but it had taken on a different meaning. It had taken on and become a vital part of the service. And far as I know, to this day, they still do it. Now, we have things in our own lives uh, as, as we look further on with Mark here we have things in our own lives that become routine that we do out of habit and one of the things hopefully at least sometimes is we, we like to we wash our hands you know I'm none of this I hope anybody reads is well you mean mama was wrong <laughs> about washing hands no it's always good to wash our hands but what it's talking about is why why wash our hands? The law that Christ is referencing here from Isaiah, when, when Isaiah is calling them hypocrites, and, and the law that the Pharisees are referring to is actually specifically intended for the priest who would be taking food from the altar or meat from the altar to be consumed because that's how they ate a lot of times. So they had to purify their hands before they could go and remove anything from the altar. Their hands had to be pure to be near the altar. That's what it was about. Now, over the years, it got changed. It didn't mean what it started, the why. Why? Because the altar is pure. I can't touch the altar with unpure hands, impure hands. But the why was lost. It was a tradition. Before you eat, wash your hands. Before you handle these things, wash your hands. Now that's not just, now here, Mark in uh, verse three, I'm thinking he's being a little facetious here. He's, he's blowing it out of proportion for us. And I tried to read it that way. Because listen, what does he say? For the Pharisees and all the Jews. Okay, that's extreme language to say all. You know, that's one of the quick ways to realize how accurate something is. If they're saying all or every, well, uh, it got to question it a little bit. So here it's saying all Jews. Well, they don't, none of them, no Jews ever eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, observing their tradition of who? Of the elders right there he didn't say it was the the tradition of God he didn't say this was what God said to do he said this is what the elders said it's a man-made law it's not a law from God 
So this is why Jesus starts coming at this. Now, when he comes at it, what is he saying? He's saying, what's in your heart? He says, you know, these guys, my, my disciples have been working hard. They've been doing right. They, their heart is in the right place. And you're daring to come up and accuse them of this law of the elders when they've been living the word of God. You're going to try to get them muddied up with something that you've constructed when here they have been going out visiting and healing and feeding and serving, living out the word of God instead of the word of man. Now, I'm going to pull in just a couple of theologians here. And just stick with me through this, and I hope that it'll... We're going to shoot it a couple of different ways, and hopefully it'll make sense before we're done. We're going to talk about Paul Tillich first. Paul Tillich is a wonderful theologian. Uh, one, of the way, one of the things that he would say, a basic function of human life, a basic function of human life is self integration, integrating oneself. To live life fully, one must go through a process of finding out a person's own center. So then move from it, so you're moving from your center then you realize what your center is and you're moving from it with a lot of freedom and strength and confidence. Because once you're grounded, once you have your center and you know what you're about, then you can go out in strength. And he would say uh, spiritual health is the moral integrity, the self-integration of a person's center. So when you're able to live out this self that you've discovered, this center that you are, and you're expressing it and you're living it out, well, then you have this renewed spiritual health to go along with it. Now, just like anything, there's a flip side. How can it be undone? What are we talking about today? We're talking about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy erodes our center by promoting disintegration, breaking us apart, rather than self-integration. Hypocrisy doesn't build up oneself. It actually causes us to break down further. Basically, this is one of the ways you can understand sin. Sin might be understood as being divided against one's self. That center we were just talking about trying to discover and attain. But if we become divided against ourselves, we're losing our center and not serving God as we ought. Now, another theologian, Soren Kierkegaard, he would say that purity of heart is to will one thing. So at this center, it's not about being focused on a thousand different things. There's a core value to it, an essential why at the center. For him, that one thing, that one thing for purity of heart is good, capital G. It is good. You see, to will as God wills, it'll have a direct effect on our heart. To will as God wills is to do good. To will as God wills is to serve God for good. Now, all that's kind of thick with theology. It, it does that sometimes. <laughs> but... One of the things that happens in the text today is, is Christ is looking at and mentions uh, at least twice in these passages that we read today is it's about our hearts. You see, I can't do anything to make 
this person over here sin, can I? This is what we forget. Sin doesn't come from out here. Sin comes from in here. Sin doesn't come because someone else has done something to me. I'm the one who's in charge of my ability to sin. Now, as good Calvinists, we all acknowledge we are poor, depraved sinners, and it's impossible for us not to sin. But we take that upon ourselves. I don't take, I don't then take the burden of someone else's sin. I have my own, and I've got plenty. And so when I'm trying to reconcile it, when I'm trying to find my center again, when I'm trying to say, what is the good? Then I have to figure out how I'm expressing it. Have I allowed something, some outside force, to deter me from doing what I know is good? Because if I have, I have sinned. If I allow an outside force to influence my ability to serve God, I am sinning. And with a bell, no less. If I allow an outside force to prevent me from serving God for good, capital G, then I am sinning. Because it does, it comes down to our heart. Where is our heart? Where is your passion? Where, where, what is your why? What is at the center of your motivation for living out your faith? Why come to church? Why worship God? Why acknowledge Christ as your Savior? Break it down. Come back to the center. Figure out what that is, that why, that why you choose Christ. Why Christ chose you and how you live it out. How you take it from being just words to being the word. How you take it from being just, you know, it's what I grew up with. At what point do you start owning it? At what point do you realize it is part of your center? It is part of who you are. I'll read just a little more from some other comments on this that stood out for me. Hypocrisy is a negotiation of authentic life. It is life acted out to fool others. Hypocrisy is life acted out to fool others. A role that we take on and pretend to be. A role that is not really us. It is a denial of our own authentic self in favor of the fabricated persona that we wish to be. Religious hypocrisy, in particular, is a most destructive kind in that it uses sacred teachings about the truth itself to elevate self-deception. It makes our pretending both a distortion of truth and a substitute for it. That's Loy Ashton. So what we're called to do is different for each and every one of us. There is a basic thing that we are called to, and that is to respond. We are called to respond to Christ in our lives. We're called to respond to the grace of God that we receive through Christ. We are called to serve God, be it for good, capital G, and what does that look like? How, what do we have to deny in our own lives in order to take on that good? 
What do we have to deny or build up in ourselves to make that good whole and not split apart because of our own hypocrisies? What do we have to do to guard that good, that response to God to prevent us from outside influences to lead us to sin? That's a challenge. It's a real challenge. You see, we have all kinds of re re religious practices that are part of who we are. And every day, we have to decide either we are a part of that or we are not. But once we find what that center is for us, once we realize what is important for God in our lives, and we realize how we're going to reach out into the community, how we're going to reach out into our faith community, the community of Eufaula, the community of Alabama, et cetera, et cetera. Once we do that, how then do we encourage others along the way? How then do we live it out and embrace it for who we are? How do we protect ourselves from these outside forces, outside influences, that would lead us to sin because it's really clear here all of these things when Jesus says for it is from within from the human heart that evil intentions come fornication theft murder and the list goes on is from the heart and so when we talk about Christ wanting to make us right in our heart Christ wants to know what's in our heart the heart now, we're not talking about the literal organ in the body that is moving the blood. In this time, for them, this would have been like this, the core of your body, the, the essence. What makes you work? What matters? Your, your very soul, everything that makes each one of us who we are. That's what it is when we talk about the heart. And Christ here again says, there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. So it's not about what we hear. It's not about what we experience. It's about how we respond to it. It's about how we allow it to influence us. Or dare I say, how can we then influence the other in a more positive way? See, there's multiple ways to look at such things. It's not just how we become influenced, but maybe we become the influence. Wouldn't that be cool to be an influence for good? So in this coming week, uh, you know, just, just find somebody this week. Maybe it's going to take a couple of days to kind of get an idea. If you don't already know, what's at your core? What's at your center? What motivates you? Why you come to church? Why? Christ chose you to do what you do. And once you do that, share it with somebody. It's a powerful experience. Now, that's a fairly intimate thing to share. It's a fairly intimate thing to try to live out as well. But to share it makes it even stronger. To share it is to build it up, is to bring it into the light. If there's one thing that I hope that people get from me is there, I, I don't have many secrets in my life. Uh, I'll, I will freely and openly say exactly what I think about almost anything. And part of that is because I feel stronger now in my center than I ever have in my life. It's how I live it out. And once you have that, other things can, others can say what they will. But if you have the security, if you have the stability, if you have that anchor in your life that's where your center is, you're ready for it. And you're confident in it. And enabled then, hopefully, to influence others rather than allowing yourselves to be, ourselves to be influenced. Now, this is a tall order, but I know each and every one of us can do it. I know each and every one of us are here for a reason. 
And when we can identify that reason and share it with somebody, how much stronger does it become? And then when we're telling somebody, well, you know what? I go to First Presbyterian. I'm sure, you know, as boisterous as we are, we all do that all the time, right? <laughs> we gladly proclaim where we go to church. But it would give you the security, hopefully, to do that. If you can have that kind of confidence and in, in grounded in your faith, then it makes it a lot easier to go out and talk to folks. It makes it a lot easier to go out and shake a hand and say, man, I, I sure would love it if you could come visit with us at, at First Presbyterian. Or, you know, even if it's, if it's not on Sunday morning, you know, we're having a dinner Wednesday night. You should come join us. We have a good time, because we do. <laughs> or we do a prayer group, or whatever it is. Okay, so the stronger we are in our center, the better equipped we are. Yes? Yes. Let us pray. Holy God, we have been truly blessed by you, strengthened by you, and empowered by you in all aspects of our lives. We pray that you continue to grant us all these things as we seek to renew ourselves, allow ourselves to be transformed by you, allow ourselves to find our center, allow ourselves to live fully and learn what it means for each of us to serve you. All this we lift in the name of your Son, our Savior. Amen. Now if you'll please stand with me as we affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed found on page 14 in the front of your hymnal. Friends, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
be seated. Please join me in prayer. Bless the church, O God. Deliver us from self-righteousness and make us holy in every way that all people may see you in the witness of your faithful servants. <coughs> Lord, we pray for our pastors, our teachers, ministers, our elders, all leadership of the church. God of light, hear our prayers. And Lord, bless all who minister in your name. Give them the wisdom to discern your truth, to honor your commandments, and to lead with humility. Let them walk blamelessly and do what is right, and speak the truth from their hearts for the world and for its leaders, God of light. Hear our prayer. Bless this nation, all nations of the world, O oh God. Guide the leaders of governments for the sake of peace. Give them sound judgment and merciful hearts. And help them be accurate, be accountable for the common good. Save them from the cynical and cynicism of war. Free them from the influence of greed. Deliver them from the temptations of social power. For the community in which we live, God of light, hear our prayer. Bless our community, O God. Help us live as friends with our neighbors and do good to one another, that homes may be free of fear and families live in peace. For children, God of light, hear our prayers. Bless children and those who care for them, O oh God. Protect them from harm. Give them what they need to grow in body and mind and provide caring adults to model for them a life of purpose and compassion. For the sick and all those in distress, God of light, Hear our prayer. Bless all who are ailing in body, mind, or spirit. Heal them of their diseases and restore them to fullness of life. We pray especially for Grady, Betty, Jimmy, Ava, Lucy, Mike, Emma, Karen, Nick, Harris, Marion, Barbara, Lonnie, Nancy, Jane, Mary, and Spencer. Holy One, we also lift to you all those missionaries, especially the Zamorano family and the Kay family, where the communities we serve through living waters, Los Hios, Atillo, Maragorta, Limino, Mara de Platano, Los Corrales, Pedra Blanca Abajo. For all who serve in military, Bill, Reed, Lamar, Brooks, and Taylor. God of light, hear our prayer. Lord, bless all those who face reproach of society, those in prison, whether innocent or guilty of crimes, those who or ostracized due to mental disease, whether or not they pose a threat to others, those who are homeless and those who are lost to addiction. Surround them with compassion and save them from hopelessness. These prayers we offer to you, God of light, boldly through the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. As God has been generous to us in our lives, let us now return to God generously. Let us receive our tithes and offering, and we'll also be taking up uh, pennies a meal, the monthly collection. Let us pray. O oh God, receive these gifts for the work of your church. With these gifts, we dedicate ourselves to live in the truth of your word and to follow your commandments with sincere hearts through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
You have been viewing the Sunday morning worship service from the First Presbyterian Church, Eufaula, Alabama. The First Presbyterian Church is located in Eufaula, Alabama at 201 North Randolph Avenue, Eufaula, Alabama, 36027. The church phone is 334-687-2523. That number again, 334-687-2523. The church staff is Pastor Rev. Brian Copeland, Director of Music and Organist Steve Hawkins, Church Administrator Renee Nolan, Sexton Veronica Curry, 